Hi, it's time to buckle up. Today's trip on the wine road is going to be a bit longer than usual. I'm Jeff Davis. Thanks for coming along. This past Saturday, my show featured just one person. I've only done that three other times. My guest is David Ramey. He has such an extensive history, having spent a good amount of time in France and other international wine regions. He consulted for a long list of wineries and continues to do so, and has owned Ramey Wine Cellars for 21 years here in Sonoma County. One thing I heard about David prior to setting up the interview is that he doesn't hold back his opinions. Naturally, that intrigued me. I've known a little bit about David Ramey for a number of years, and recently his name has come up in interviews with other winemakers. And then I met him at a Russian River Valley wine growers event in September. That laid the groundwork for this week's interview. You may have heard his name associated with some controversy lately, and we'll touch upon that subject later in the hour. We met at one of his two production facilities he has in Healdsburg, and this is how it began. So David, in the last six months, I've interviewed Jennifer Higgins at Lambert Bridge, Matt Hughes at Brassfield Estate Winery, and Christopher O'Gorman at Rodney Strong. And I imagine you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a handful of consulting clients. I, I, yes. I used to have more, but it's, they've dropped away. I really haven't added new clients. I, 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 enjoy, I enjoy working with the clients that I, I have now, and I continue to do so because they're really great people and helping both the owners establish or grow their business and the generally younger winemakers that I work with, sort of mentoring them, sharing my experience, which is some four decades now. You know, you learn something from all that time. And um, it's a, for, for, for quality people, it's a pleasure um, to, to share that. So right now my clients are, you know, Rodney Strong, uh, the reserve wines and the single vineyard wines. Tom Klein, the owner, is one of the great gentlemen of the wine business, and I've been with them for 12 or 13 years now. Um, uh, there's a uh, vineyard in um, Sonoma Valley, uh, Westwood, which is doing great work. Ben Kane is the winemaker. Um, I work for uh, Jean-Charles Boisset, Oh, on the uh, on the Buena Vista project, oh. and that's been fascinating because you know, I mean, I worked with Chris Chomoex with Dominus, and then with Jean Jean Charles. You know, the French people I think have the French, at least in the wine business, have a greater appreciation for California history than we do, right. and and it really takes somebody of the vision and resources of Jean Charles to come in and spend the money to rehabilitate the historic stone buildings uh, of the Buena Vista winery. And that's really been a great thing for, for historically, for us in, in California. Yeah, he speaks lovingly of California and, and our, our history. And you're right, he knows more about our history than a lot of people do. He does, and he's married to Gina Gallo, and, and uh, I think he spends more time here than he does in France. And he owns a lot of wineries in France, too. And then I have one other, one other client up in um, uh, Lake County, Brassfield Estate, which is a really um, special area in High Valley in the northeast corner of uh, Lake County, very high, high area. Yeah. I just had Matt on my show not too long ago, and uh, I really enjoy the wines they're making oh, good, over there yeah. at Brassfield. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. yeah. You know, going back to your early days, I envy the opportunity you had to travel to France uh, to learn their techniques, and you got to do so right out of UC Davis. Well, I knew that once I got out of, uh, got the graduate, the master's degree in enology, that once you get on the, on the career merry-go-round, it's very hard to get off. And so I knew there was a a window between finishing school and starting the career to do that. And honestly, for me, it's, it was twofold. If I were going, I mean, the question was, do it, did I work in Bordeaux or in Burgundy? I mean, even in 1979, 78, 79, it was Chardonnay and Cabernet. Chardonnay and Cabernet were, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they were the, the big grapes. And so I had to, uh, I, I really wanted to learn where, those grapes had been made for hundreds of years because I thought they maybe might have learned something about doing so. And I, I think that was true. I ended up choosing 
uh, 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 well, Bordeaux, and uh, in fact, Pomerol, which was Merlot-based rather than Cabernet-based, but there's, honestly, there's not a as much difference as people want to want to think but so partly i wanted to learn the classical techniques of making wine developed over centuries in the old world and apply them to california fruit um the other like for example fining you know classical fining agents in bordeaux it's egg white for red wine and a lot of uh, my younger colleagues are inexperienced with finding agents, classical finding agents. And, and so that was a tremendous learning experience. In case you're wondering, finding is the act of adding a product to wine to remove floating particles. They attract and bind or absorb the sediment, become heavy, and sink to the bottom of the wine as sediment. That leaves the wine clearer. But the other half was, and this is really quite uh, serious actually, is that I, I really... It's an accident that we're born where we are, in the socioeconomic strata that we exist in, speaking the language that we do, being raised in whatever religion you happen to be, have been raised in. And I, I just think that if people uh, around the world spent time, months, three months, six months, living in another world, speaking that language, living with those people, that it would contribute to world peace. I, I totally agree with that. It, it's absolutely unmistakable. And, and that's, and, and, and so I ended up, for example, I've been on the board of directors now for, well, since 1991 or 92 for communicating for agriculture, which has a uh, relationship with INS, Immigration and Naturalization Services. And we give out the J-1 visas that uh, the foreign kids come in to the United States in and work not only in wineries but in equine in Kentucky and, and farms in Minnesota where they're based. Uh, this year we had a, a French girl, we had uh, an Argentine. Um, uh, you know, we have we have uh, international kids every year, and so I just for me it was both. Uh, it was fifty fifty learning to make wine classically in the old world and becoming more of a citizen of the world than where I happen to have been born. Ah, good for you, yeah. Yeah, the more I travel, the more I want to, and the more I do appreciate people around the world. Yep. You know? um, but getting the opportunity that you've had and in, in going over there to France, do you feel that um, that helped you get positions at respected wineries here, uh, the accolades you received, and the innovations you've accomplished? Those are results of your time in France? Well, only, only indirectly from the, the, the sort of star on the resume, I would say. That may have gotten me the job, but I think in terms of the style and quality that I've made over the decades, that that really has come, and it's a fundamental difference, Jeff. It's a, it, it, that really has come from becoming comfortable with letting nature make the wine rather than trying to drive it as an engineering project from the outside in. Our wines make themselves. Nature makes our wines from the inside out. And I think there's a subtle harmony and, and, and that, that comes from that, that that I've carried through into the wines that I've made over the decades. Yeah, isn't there a French term, the hardest thing to do is nothing at all? Nothing at all. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, And a lot of times, uh, young winemakers in particular want to poke and prod. It's a lot. It is. I mean, this is an analogy, an old analogy, but it's a lot like raising kids. And a lot of times, you know, I mean, these days with helicopter parents, <laughs> you know, uh, finding out that may not be the best way to do it. Let the kid go out and ride the bike around and crash a couple of times and get into a fight or two and find out, you know, what the world's like a little bit. Sometimes nature pushes things along in, in, a, in a way that creates a stronger wine or a stronger child down the road. Yes, I'd say in retrospect, I'm proud of the scars on my knees and elbows, and I think I'm a better man for it. 
<laughs> so I agree with those statements. After his early years in France, with a stop in Australia, David had the chance to work with some of the respected winemakers and wineries in Sonoma County and eventually Napa Valley. Well, when I, when I left Muax in Pomerol and then I went to Australia, worked at, for Lindemann's Caradoc, a large winery, uh, I came back and I was fortunate to get the job as assistant winemaker to Zelma Long at Simi. You know, when I came out of Davis, uh, the industry was really just getting off the ground. And all of my colleagues, uh, and there were a bunch of us in 77, 78, 79 at Davis who had degrees in literature, as I did, political science, philosophy, psychology, history. Um, and, and then we got out and we didn't want to become lawyers or get an MBA. MBA wasn't even hardly a thing back in then. But, um, and, and so we all ended up being art, artistically motivated to you know, go to, go to Davis and, and figure out how to make wine. And we were all passionate about it. Um, uh, but I knew that I didn't Everybody, every, all my colleagues got full charge winemaking jobs right away, which you could do then. You can't do now. You come out of Davis, you end up being a cellar worker for, you know, three or four years before you even get an assistant winemaker job. But in those days, you come out of Davis, you get a winemaker job right away. I didn't want that. I knew that I did not know how to make wine. That's why I wanted to work with Zelma. And that was a tremendous thing we did. For almost five years, we did good work together, and um, and a great person to work with. And she, yeah, a tremendous person. Um, and and uh, mostly, what I learned really is I learned production management, as opposed to winemaking. It's a little, it's a little like the difference between managing a restaurant and being a chef. You know, being a chef is okay. Ingredients, plating, technique. Running a restaurant, you got to have, you got to get the food from. A to Z, um, so that was tremendous. And then, and then I was asked to replace Mary Edwards at Matanzas Creek, so I built that, got that building built, and, and grew the brand some. And then, Christian Muex had in mind that we would work together. He asked me uh, back to to Pomerol in '89, and so I went back. And my now wife and business partner, then fiance Carla, went with me, and. Um, and we were married over there in in in, nice. Palm, in um, more or less in Pomerol, right bank, Montagne Saint Emilion, and um, it wasn't time to work together. So uh, I ended up taking a job at Chalk Hill. So for six years to the day, I helped uh, really kind of establish Chalk Hill, and then Christian convinced me to come over and um, be the winemaker and effectively general manager at Dominus and be in charge of getting the, the building built. But that was that was the the opportunity to start our own brand because I said, yeah. you know, but Christian you don't you don't make any white wine and he said, Well, you want to make a little Chardonnay on the side, that's okay. And so a light bulb went off. It's like, Yeah, I know how to do that. I can do that. So I, I knew Larry Hyde from having bought his Semillon for the Matanzas Creek Sauvignon Blanc and he found a little Chardonnay for me, and we started with 260 cases of Hyde Vineyard Chardonnay from the 1996 vintage. And at that time, you were making it for Dominus, which is in Napa Valley? Well, I, my job was, was with Dominus, but this was Ramey Wine Cellars. So this was the beginning of Ramey Wine Cellars. So was Dominus still not making any Chardonnay then, or they weren't, no, they weren't no, selling they, any? Never have, never will. <laughs> never have, never did, never will. Okay. No, no, uh-uh. It was, it was, it's, it's a so he was just throwing you a bone then, basically. Well, yeah. if you want to make some Chardonnay, yeah. go ahead, but yeah, exactly. leave no, me out so, of it. Yeah, so it wasn't for it wasn't for that. It was yeah. it was Ramey Wine Cellars. It was the beginning. In fact, we designed that label uh, in 1997, and it, it has almost not changed ever since. Twenty okay. is that twenty years later? 20 years, yeah. um, and then uh, and then I, I met Leslie Rudd, and and uh, I uh, agreed to go help him turn the Gerard Winery into Rudd Estate. So after I got the building built at Dominus, um, I left and went and went over and helped Les and grew grew the brand. And then we've been independent since uh, since '02, really, whatever that is, 15 years, I guess. 
Well, it was certainly good to get that experience under your under your belt. And well, you could joke that you know I I, I made my mistakes on other people's nickels, but I I, I did some good work too. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you certainly built up a lot of those brands. Uh, right time, right place. You craft a few varietals, but uh, Chardonnay seems to be your muse. Well, you know we between. See me, Matanzas Creek and Chalk Hill. I'd probably made more Chardonnay than anything else. And then for Ramey, we, we, we started with Chardonnay because I couldn't compete with, with, with the Cabernet, with, with, with Dominus. So for five years before we added Cabernet, we, we just made Chardonnay. And we do make more Chardonnay than anything else. And, yeah, I would say people think of us for Chardonnay. And then, and then of course, as we located in Healdsburg, which is sort of full circle coming back, home here we are in the russian river valley and then we bought our property in russian river so we probably make more chardonnay than anything else so there is a natural association there yeah yeah we're, we're about a what a mile from simi uh r- right where we are uh, maybe two miles right now yeah it's definitely full circle yeah. well you like to make uh, wines that are fully ripened i read and, and fully ripened grapes tend to lean to uh, being very fruit forward and sometimes, as they used to call it, fruit bombs, but your wines are not like that. They're still very well balanced. We, we, as, as, as there's been a fashion over the last 15 years for uh, fruit bomb wines, we've always sort of stuck to the middle path. And then subsequently, when with In Pursuit of Balance and sort of a reaction to the Bob Parker style of, of really uber ripe wines. Some people said, well, we're going to make 12.5% alcohol wines just as a reaction against that. And I've never been at either extreme. We've always sort of uh, hewed to the middle ground. What are your, uh, what's your alcohol level usually, usually like? Well, uh, somewhere I would say well, with with sidebar and the, the non malolactic wines, the rosé and stuff, those can be, you know, right around 13%, uh, 13, 13.5, the Kerner, the rosé, the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, with the Chardonnays, uh, we tend to be in the in the low to mid 14s, which is um, where I think our grapes are. There's a nice balance there, um, you know. Sometimes people don't realize or don't know that white burgundy will hit 15% naturally in a favored site in a ripe vintage. Mm-hmm. And, and we, do, we need to remember that, that the great vintages in France have always been the warmer vintages, the riper grape vintages, the higher alcohol vintages, and that when they have a, a, a colder vintage, i.e. a weaker vintage, where maybe they harvested at 12.5 to 13% alcohol, that they would chaptalize to 13.5 or 13.8 because alcohol itself brings a certain richness and pleasantness to the palate. Yeah. Even sometimes a little sweetness. A, a touch of sweetness, uh, you know, through, via the alcohol is, is not a bad thing. So the correct reaction to 16% alcohol wines is not... 12% alcohol wines, just as the reaction to the appropriate reaction to over oaked wines is over oaked Chardonnay is not uh, stainless steel Chardonnay. Do you know? It's the, the middle ground seems to always, to me, be the wiser course. And your winemaking, by incorporating the balance, I, I, I see it being not just with the flavors in the wine, but also your. Um, your old world methods paired with the modern innovative techniques well uh, you know I, I like to quote paul draper one of the other great gentlemen of the wine business who would say you know the grape is the only thing that has all the ingredients it needs to make a finished processed product and uh, my corollary with that is, you know, nature's been making wine for at least 4,000 years before Louis Pasteur and the analogist showed up. So uh, letting nature make the wine is um, uh, it's the course we choose to follow. Yet with the winemaker's hand, the final product is so much better than it was 4,000 years ago. And, you know, where the grapes are grown also makes a difference. 
So I asked David about the importance of terroir, that is, the vineyard soil, location, and climate in which the grapes are grown, compared to the efforts the winemaker contributes. Well, both. Um, let's, let's, let's go to tomatoes. Uh, if you have, let's say you're lucky enough to have two houses, and one of them has got a backyard of uh, heavy clay soil, and then the other house or maybe even the same house, same backyard, you put some raised beds full of loam and compost, you're going to grow two different kinds of tomatoes in a hard scrabble clay pan versus the raised bed. This is not controversial. It's like, you know, yeah, terroir makes a difference. Now, that said, winemaking comes later. So, for example, I was at a a conference on terroir in uh, gevry Chambertin in 2000, I keep getting invited back. My friend Jackie Gligo runs it, uh, but um, I, I don't have I don't have a lot of uh, you know I don't have time to go anymore. But at that time, Henri Jaillet was still alive. He was the Eminence Grise of this first Terroir conference, and uh, at the end, he said, you know, we all gave speeches and shared our wine, and he, and he said, well, you know, I'm translating from the French. Well, you know, it's uh, half the grapes. And it's half uh, what you do with them. So think about that. That's really important. It's half the grapes, and it's half what you do with them. And those are both big halves. Mm -hmm. And the winemaking comes second, actually. So it's a little like saying, I mean, an analogy I used earlier today is if you've got the wax to make the seal on the royal envelope, Okay, the wax is the grapes. It's red or it's gold or it's softer or it's harder. But the, uh, whatever you call that thing with the crest, the the, the tamper, that's the winemaking. Now, which comes second? Which comes later? The winemaking. Another analogy, a lot of analogies between making wine and cooking. You give the same recipe, the same ingredients, to five different chefs and you tell them make this dish you're going to get five different dishes identical kitchen everything the same you're still going to get five different dishes because what comes later what's the final imprimatur but to say that it's it's, so it's not either or it's both to say that terroir doesn't exist is silly we know that grapes from here make different wine than grapes from there and Relating to your chef analogy, does it mean one chef is better than the other if it's different? They're just, they're just different, yeah, exactly. And I can eat this chili, or I can eat that chili, and I can enjoy them both. Right. Yeah, I, I try a lot of different wines to make sure that I still enjoy yeah, all the I, ones I'm There you I'm are, enjoying. exactly, yeah. What is it about this one I like? I don't know, but it's really good. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work staying on top of all this stuff. It yeah. is. Every, every night, you know, it's more homework. David Ramey. Earlier I mentioned his winery is involved in a controversial endeavor to build a larger facility on Russian River Valley's West Side Road that will include a public tasting room, a space for guest accommodations, caves for his barrels and tanks, but as you'll hear in the next break, those won't be visible from the road. He's also planning on producing up to 60,000 cases a year. Although it was approved by the Sonoma County Zoning Board in September, it was strongly opposed by the West Side Community Association. As our interview was finishing up, I asked David if he had anything else he wanted to talk about, and that provided the opportunity to express his thoughts on the matter of his larger project at Westside Farms. You know, for our, for our winery project, we, we have been in the process for five years. And I, I think in terms of agriculture here in Sonoma County, we're at a, a, a crossroads or a turning point. We'll see. But... Ag zone lands are are under assault by people retiring to wine country, buying ag zone parcels, building a McMansion, and then saying there's too many wineries, there's too many tasting rooms, there's too much tourism, there are too many hotels. This is a very serious issue. The town of Sonoma just passed a temporary moratorium on tasting rooms in the plaza. Um, it's a, it's a sort of a, you know, get the crowd riled up pitchfork thing. And yet, I've been here since 1980. And as, as we said a little earlier, before you, you know, before you turned the, the mic on, uh, Jeff, uh, 
you know, 35 years ago, you couldn't get a decent meal in Sonoma County. And now there's, there's a dozen great restaurants in Healdsburg. And boy, we're really happy. We like that. That's a good thing. And it's the vineyards and the wine industry that, that number one, allow that to happen. But number two, keep the open space in open space. I grew up in Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley. My family moved to Sunnyvale in 1958 when it was orchards all around our little subdivision. I went to school from third grade through 12th grade with Steve Wozniak, graduated from Homestead High School. So I watched Silicon Valley become itself at the expense of cherries, prunes, apricots, and walnuts. Now those were commodity crops that the farmers could not make a living at, could not compete with housing, and that's what happened to Santa Clara Valley, which used to be a garden spot. Sonoma County is at risk of the exact same thing, and the only thing that's kept Napa and Sonoma in agriculture this long is the value-added proposition of wine. Because without the value-added proposition of wine, the growers can't get the $10,000 an acre return, gross return, that they need to stay in farming. And so we're really at a crux here where people need to decide, as John Booker asked Supervisor Gore once, well, what defines rural character? Is it agriculture or is it houses? It's a polarizing issue for sure, but he's receiving support for his due diligence, making sure his new winery on ag land is designed properly with all aspects thoughtfully considered. I asked him what he plans on doing differently at the new facility. Probably the most significant thing would be that our barrel cellars will be cut and fill caves. So we'll have a, right now you hear some AC with. This, this leased facility in Healdsburg, we've got tanks and barrels in the same room. There, they're going to be separated, and they're going to be, you know, subterranean. One, so that we won't see the building from West Side Road, but two, for energy efficiency and, and constancy of temperature. Uh, without the, when you run AC units, they tend to dry the air out, so there'll be a little right. more humidity, too. Um, so that's one thing. The next thing would be... Uh, we're, we're going to have uh, square tanks um, rather than cylindrical tanks, which is uh, more space efficient um, and also uh, gives a little more cap to juice ratio. Um, so there's subtle things like that. But what I would say is that if anybody's ever been to Chateau Rayas, um, you know, or various places in Burgundy, you don't need a lot of high-tech equipment to make really good wine. You really don't. Um, so right. it, it's it's going to be nicer because we're going to own it, and it's going to be new. But um, where we are here, I, I have all the same bells and whistles that I put in at, at Dominus and at Rudd in terms of heating and cooling tanks, et cetera. Uh, technology doesn't make wine. We don't have computer-driven temperature monitoring and control in our fermentations. It, it just doesn't matter because if you talk to one winemaker, he's going to say, well, I ferment, I let it get really hot. I ferment at 92 max, 92 Fahrenheit. And then somebody else will say, no, I ferment at 86. And then over the years, we've come down to where we actually ferment at 72, which degrees Fahrenheit, sort of, which is the optimal temperature from ye- for yeast, just sort of like we like, as humans, we like 72 degrees. It's nice and, and comfortable. So those sorts of things, you talk to five different winemakers, you're going to get five different answers. And so there is no one right way. And so all this focus on on control and technology and whatnot uh, is not something that we're uh, big fans of. It was at this point that I lightly joked that the tasting room experience will likely be better at the new winery than at the current production facilities he has now. Uh, a lot of people come. We're, we're in two. We have two industrial warehouses in Healdsburg. One is uh, uh, Tilt Up Concrete. That's where we receive customers. The one we're in right now is, is uh, Metal uh, Butler Building. So there the tasting is going to be in a, in a historic refurbished hop kiln. There's only, I think, eight remaining on the, 
on the north coast. Hopkiln Winery is one mile up the street. That's one. The Martinelli's have one. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we, it's, it was not historic when we bought it, but it is now. Um, and, and it's falling down, and we hope to be able to actually refurbish it before it falls down. Yeah, I can picture that building, and it's, it's, it's not in good shape. It is not in good shape, yeah. It was built in 1948-49, and so anything over 50 years old is, is subject to historic designation, which, you know, we went before the... Landmarks Commission, and they decided, and they said, okay, all right, that's the way it is, fine. Well, yeah, if you can refurbish that, it'll be a, a wonderful piece it, for the property. It should be, yeah. David Ramey of Ramey Wine Cellars. I'm interested to see what that property will look like once they get past uh, any remaining hurdles and it's completed. It was a pleasure to talk with David and taste his wine. He has Ramey Cellars with a good selection of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Syrah, He also has a brand called Sidebar, which features a crisp, enjoyable Sauvignon Blanc and a Zinfandel. And though it's about 78% Zin, if I remember correctly, it has about 13 other varieties making up the other 22% or so. I wish David and his family continued success. If you're still listening, hey, thanks for hanging through the entire podcast. This was a long one. If you don't mind, give me one more minute to hear and consider this request. If you're like me, you enjoy a number of podcasts. Some of my favorites are produced by Radiotopia and released by PRX. Recently, all of their podcasts participated in a fundraising. And that's essentially what I'm doing as a member of Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash on the wine road, you'll see a video I produced explaining how it works. For as little as $5 a month, you can join my wine community and ensure that I can continue producing interviews with the industry's fascinating people. You know, most of us in this competitive podcast world don't get paid for our time. And believe me, traveling each week to record these interviews takes a lot of time. When you have a moment, look up patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash on the wine road. Thank you. I appreciate your consideration. And I look forward to sharing more stories with you again very soon here on The Wine Road.